Hello. We look forward to get a fresh understanding about the things of God. We know that the Bible tells us that uh, His Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. His Word should be the one guiding us in how we are to achieve uh, the purposes of God and to get hold of our destiny and everything that comes in between. The equipping, the anointing, the guidance, and the outpouring of grace and God's favor and His Spirit. Today we'll be talking about the more excellent way. So as we start, let's bow down our heads and say a little prayer. Father, indeed, we want to open our hearts that we may get to have understanding, to be fertile soil for the sowing of good seed, which is your word. For we want, O oh God, your word to germinate, to grow, to mature and bear fruit so that more blessing can be released and received, received and released. So Father, anoint us, grant us joy, let your grace be more than enough today. This we pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Okay. The more excellent way. We'll read from the book of Malachi chapter 3. Okay. In fact, we'll be talking about the more excellent way in how we are to give. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. Wow, this is the word of God. This passage tells us that if we give our tithes, God will open the windows of heaven. And the promise is, pour out such blessing that there will not be enough room to contain it. You know, God is always right. He doesn't lie. When anything God has promised is not working, something may have gone wrong. And God can never go wrong. Perhaps the people who received the instructions have gone wrong in performing those instructions. Let me tell you a story about the woman who um, approached her pastor after the worship service. <clears throat> this is an old woman, and she sincerely approached her pastor for enlightenment. Uh, this woman, by the way, was an exemplary and godly Christian. No pastor could have asked God for a better church member. So if there was a problem, she was the one fixing it. And she said, Pastor, all of you pastors say that if we give our tithes, God will open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. Pastor, I have never missed a tithe in 20 years. You know, sometimes tithing for me is a decision between choosing between my tithes and a bus fare. But I choose to give my tithe and then just walk one hour back to church and back home. Pastor, I'm just an old woman who would like to see the blessing of the Lord upon my life before I breathe my last breath. Pastor, help me. Please. Why is my tithe not working for me? Everything we know about tithing was inherited teachings of tithing from our spiritual fathers. This woman, this old woman has been faithfully tithing for the last 20 years. And she even chose to walk because she had to give or pay her tithe. Very faithful. She gave first to God before she gave anything for himself, for herself. 
question, why is her type not working for her? As a matter of fact, why is it not working as it should be for thousands of people around the world? Could it be that we were taught to type into the wrong priesthood? Genesis 14, 17 to 23. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Cheder Laumer and the kings who were with him, then the king of Milke, the, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Okay, bread and wine. He was the priest of God Almighty, and he blessed him on earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand and he gave him a tithe of all now the king of Sodom said to Abraham give me the persons and take the goods for yourselves but Abraham said to the king of Sodom I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high the possessor of heaven and earth I will not take anything from a thread to a sandal strap that I will not take anything that is yours lest you should say I have made Abraham rich. Church, you are the seed of Abraham. How come Abraham is tithing into a priesthood that most Christians don't even talk about? How much do you know about the priesthood of Melchizedek? Melchizedek chapter 3, tithing system, is popular. But we may have to move to a more excellent way of tithing, driven by grace and faith instead of the Mosaic law or being legalistic. New Testament believers are not under the law, but under grace. John 1 verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Get into the kingdom principle tithing church, which is under this dispensation of grace instead of legalism. You know, there are thousands of faithful tithers all over the world. Yes. And they are wondering why the tithe is not working for them as it should. The question is, is tithing for today? Hebrews 7 verses 8 to 10 says, Here on earth, mortal men receive tithes, but there in heaven, he, Jesus, receives them of whom it is witness, witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, okay, the Levitical priesthood, who receives tithes, paid tithes to Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the low ends of his father when Melchizedek met him. Low ends of Abraham, that is. Many well meaning Christians, kingdom citizens, okay, living in the kingdom, tell us how their life and personal economy changed for the better when they started tithing. And I pray that is true with all of us here. There are also sincere, God-loving children of God. Yes, sincere, God-loving children of God whose tithe is not working for them. They have been tithing for years and years and years, but the windows of heaven never open. Why is that? Let's see. Melchizedek, the king priest, in Genesis 14, intercepted Abraham. And we see that tithing in its roots and origins is always connected to a legitimate and God-designated priesthood. And in that um, situation, it was Melchizedek, king of Salem. In Abraham's case, the tithes left his hands Everything that he got, the spoils he got when he won uh, against the four kings who, who invaded Sodom and Gomorrah. The tithes left his hands and they were all given, the tithes were given to the order 
of Melchizedek to the priest. The tithes of the spoils of Abraham that he had taken from the four kings that raided, who raided God's Adam Gomora, did not end up in one of his private bank accounts. He gave it to Melchizedek. You know, there is a place of prosperity, a place of true biblical prosperity that God has for his people. Yes, place of true biblical prosperity. I believe that God desires to bless you, to bless us, to bless his children with both financial and material resources. What for? To advance the kingdom of God here on earth. God is always interested in the motives and condition of the heart. The motives and condition of the heart and how well we manage the little that he entrusted to us. The primary purpose of prosperity is not for ourselves, but for others and for his kingdom. Yes, believers who come into a financial and material prosperity, but who fail to understand divine restraint, divine restraint, not to spend on our wants, not to spend excessively, not to spend without any 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 reason at all you know when we fail to understand divine uh, divine respect it becomes a curse to ourselves and it also can bring great injury and harm to the cause of Christ let's see poverty and prosperity are two different extremes Poverty and prosperity, they are extreme, extreme human conditions. But Jesus, when he was here on earth, he spent a lot of his time talking about stewardship. It's not about poverty or prosperity. He spent most of his time about stewardship. Let's look at the story in scripture. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. We'll see. Who was justified before the Lord? Jesus taught us about two men, of whom tithe, one, one whom tithe, one of them tithe, and one of them did not. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Yes, let's go to the temple and pray. <laughs> one was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax gatherer, the IR. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. On the other hand, the tax gatherer standing some distance away, was beating his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. So which one was justified before God? The tither or the non-tither? God justified the tax gatherer or the non-tither in this story. Not because he did not pay his tithes, but because he sincerely humbled himself before God. The passage of scripture is actually a lesson on the power of humility before God and was never intended to undermine tithing. I think it's not a license to walk in pride before the Lord. No. It's because God wishes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You know, some Christians are not experiencing the benefits of tithing because they tithe from pride. Instead of tithing, 
with humility before God. I want to trace the prophetic element in scripture. You see, the Bible is a prophecy. Prophecy is actually God talking to us. So when you read the Bible, that is prophecy. God talking to you when you read the Bible. Okay. In Amos chapter 3 verse 7, it says, Surely the Lord will do nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. What? He will not do anything unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I tell you, God will not do anything in your life unless you read the Bible and he will speak to you through the Bible. And then he will start doing things. You know why things are not happening in your life? Because you are not getting God's uh, instructions to you. Read the Bible. Understand the Bible. Get what is saying. Because God will want to do something in your life. But you have to receive it. Because God will not do anything unless he reveals his secret to you or to us. Now, to really capture the hidden meaning of scripture, when you read scripture, you don't read it for intellectual means. You read it so that your spirit man may receive insight, illumination, and understanding and revelation. So to capture the hidden meanings of scripture, it requires a prophetic hearing ear and prophetic hearing, seeing eye. Okay? Prophetic hearing ear and prophetic seeing eye. The Lord has made provision for us, his children, to have both a hearing ear and a seeing eye. Yes, you have it, a hearing ear and a seeing eye. Just believe it and activate it in faith. Proverbs 20, verse 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Wow. There is no reason why we cannot hear and see in the spirit. We have to believe it and operate in that. Now, why would God do such a thing? Give us a hearing ear and a seeing eye. You see, much of the spiritual treasures, spiritual treasures, more valuable than the silver and the gold, the cattle of thousand hills, the spiritual treasures, they're hidden in his word and it would be lost. If we are not able to see beyond the obvious meaning of a passage of scripture or a particular verse, we have to get hold of it with a hearing ear and a seeing eye, or else the secrets will be lost. Important biblical truths and that are connected, are interconnected from the Old Testament to the New. All those biblical truths from the old to the new, they are inter interconnected. And if we don't have that hearing ear and that seeing eye, it will all be lost in translation. Okay. Now, Abraham's tie to Melchizedek in Genesis 14 show us the connection between the Old Testament priestly order of Melchizedek and the eternal priestly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, they are connected. There's a prophetic word, prophetic connection here. There is a deep and far-reaching prophetic elements in the practice of tithing. Well, even for God laid down his law or his words regarding tithing, Abraham, without any word, without any law, tithed to Melchizedek. Okay. The very first act of tithing was done by Abraham. Now the order of Melchizedek. Okay. Hebrews 5, verses 5 and 6. So to Christ, yes, the Messiah, did not exalt himself to be made high priest, no, but was appointed and exalted by him who said to him, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, you are a priest. 
forever after the order of Melchizedek. Wow. Without understanding the prophetic element in Genesis 14, we will fail to recognize just, just how powerful Abraham's meeting will make will with Melchizedek is. It was so powerful. It was a statement, and we cannot just read by it without getting hold of the hearing and the seeing of the prophecy there. Abram's meeting with Melchizedek in the Valley of Shaveh or the Valley of Kings was one of the most important God encounters. Yes, important God encounters that man could ever have. Under the New Testament, believers are not under the order of Levi. No. That was the Old Testament. The Levitical priest order of, of, of and under the order of Levi, where Aaron was the high priest. We are under the order of Melchizedek. Okay? This means that tithing must also follow the same pattern. Tithing to Melchizedek. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Malachi tithing system, okay? Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offering, you, have, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. We agree with those who believe that there is no need for tithing under the New Testament. However, Malachi 3 may be erroneous foundation for teaching tithing to New Testament believers. Some of the greatest pros prosperity preachers have built their whole ministry around this highly misunderstood passage from the book of Malachi. There is a most excellent pattern typing, and that is applicable to New Testament believers that clearly transcends Malachi 3 and the covenant of Levi. And as we do so, we want to see fundamental questions regarding Malachi. Who was the prophet Malachi's primary audience, target audience? Who? Who was the primary target audience of Malachi? Okay. I guess it's the Israelites, the Jews. What was the main objective for writing the book of Malachi? Wow. When we want to see the objective, we take the whole context of the book of Malachi. Not just Malachi chapter 3. Start with chapter 1, chapter 2, and then chapter 3. And then chapter 4, get the main objective why Malachi wrote that prophetic book. To answer the first question, we want to examine the passages of scripture from the book of Malachi closely. Okay, Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is the reverent fear due me? That is God talking. Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest. Okay? Says the Lord of it to you, O priest. Was God talking to Israelites? He was talking to the Levitical priest. O priest who despise my name. You say, how and in what way have we despised your name? When you priests offer blind animals for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you, when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Present such a thing, a blind or lame or sick animal, now to your governor in payment of your taxes and see what will happen. Will he be pleased with you? Or will he receive you graciously? That's the Lord of hosts. Now then, I, Malachi, you priest, beg you priest, 
entreat God earnestly that he will be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand as a defective animal for sacrifice, will he accept it or show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. The book of Malachi was not written to rebuke the children of Israel. You know, the 11 tribes who are not priestly tribes, who were not of the tribe of Levi, there were 11 tribes who were not the priests. It was not written to rebuke the children of Israel who were robbing God of tithes and offering. No. Malachi was rebuking many of the Levitical priests who were mishandling the Lord's tithes and offerings. They were stealing from God. Yes, they were stealing from God by sacrificing animals and with blemishes to God. Yes, the Israelites brought their offering, but the Levitical priest chose them, set aside the, the, the unblemished for themselves, and offered the blemished animals, the blemished sacrifice to God. They kept the best animals for themselves. God even asked them, why did, why they did not honor him like a son is supposed to honor his father? Wow. Church, we have a heavenly father, right? We are his children. We are sons and daughters of God. And we are to honor him. Bringing a type in humility before the Lord honors our Father. So we need to pay our tithes. We need to give our tithes in humility, cheerfully, if we are ever to honor our Father. Or else, He will ask, where is my honor due to me as a father? Where is the honor due to me as a master? Let's bring our tithes. Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. Huh? Malachi was speaking to the priest. Verse 2. If you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessing. Wow. God will curse their blessing. Yes, I have already turned them to curses because you do not lay it to heart. God's going to curse your blessing. Wow. Malachi chapter 2 verse 7. For the priest's lips should guard and keep pure the knowledge of my law. Wow. The priest should have more understanding and depth regarding the law of God. And the people should seek or inquire and require instruction at his mouth. The people will ask the priest to understand more of God's word. For he is a messenger of the laws of messenger of the Lord of hosts. The priest is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. Now, Malachi chastised members of the Levitical priesthood and they were represent, misrepresenting God. The message of many prosperity teachers today, it says, you will be cursed with a curse if you do not tithe. It was actually referring to the curse that God has pronounced in Malachi. You know, the curse, I will curse your blessing. That was the curse. God had already promised that he would allow a curse to come upon the Levites if they did not repent from their evil deeds. Now, God said, I will curse your blessing. What was the blessing of the Levites? I will curse your blessing. What was the, ble what, what was the blessing God is going to curse? The blessing of the Levites was their unrestricted access to the presence of God. Yes, they were priests. They can come and go into the presence of God. And every necessary benefit that came from serving God's temple, they received it. They were favored. That was their blessing. 
they could easily come into the presence of God, listen and talk to God and minister to God. And if they don't repent, God will remove the access that they had to his presence. Church, can you imagine? If we don't type, God will remove the access that we should have as children into our Father's presence. We don't want that to happen. We don't want God to curse the blessing. To be able to enter into the presence of God, to just press on and press into him, that is a blessing. More valuable than all the gold and the silver and the cattle of a thousand hills. Special access to God's presence was the only reason the children of Israel gave tithes to the Levites. Yes, because the Levites did not have any other form of income. Their work was to minister to God and to minister to the people. They had access to God in favor for the people, in behalf of the people, and for themselves. That's why the Israelites tied to them. You know, there are many ministers who are having a hard time to make both ends meet because the tithes that the church is receiving is not enough to sustain the cost of living for their family. Why? Because there are no tithes coming in. I truly believe that everyone who is in the church, God brought them in. And if everyone died, there will be more than enough for that minister. Yes. But if there is no one who is really serious in tithing, then of course, many who do not tithe will not have access into the holy presence of God. And they will just be coming to church. And then coming to church will just be, uh, uh, it will not be excited. There will be no excitement. It will be boring. Why? It's just the natural thing. The meetings, the activities are not able to enter into the exciting, holy, awesome, majestic presence of God. Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 to 10. But you have turned aside out of the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction in the law. He's talking to the Israelites, the Levites. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi with me, says the Lord of hosts. Even from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, the Lord of hosts says. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob or defraud God? Yet you defraud me, you rob and defraud me. But you say, in what way do, you, do we rob or defraud you? You have withheld your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Yeah, the whole nation is also cursed. Why? Because instead of an unblemished offering, the one that was offered was a blemished offering. And those who brought the unblemished offering, they were affected by the action, by the deeds of the Levitical priest. Okay. Now, there, there may be food in my house and prove me. Now by it, says the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing, that there will be no room to receive it. Now, the Levitical priest doesn't have to separate the best for them and just offer the sick, the lame, and the, and, 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 the, and, the, and the animals or the blessings that are not really good. Why? God said, if you just give me what is supposed to be mine, 
I will open up the gates of heaven, the floodgates. And you don't have to worry about what is good, what is bad. No, you're going to get the best. So I'm going to open the windows of heaven and you will have no room to contain those good blessings. Just give me what is mine. Wow. In Malachi 3, the prophet Malachi continued his harsh rebuke on the priest, the Levitical priest. Contrary to what many prosper, prosperity teachers preach, preach or teach, Malachi is not a standalone. Malachi 3 is not a standalone chapter. No, it's connected to the chapter 1, chapter 2, and they are all saying a message to the Levitical priests. It is not independent of the prophet Malachi's ongoing rebuke against an ailing priesthood. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God accuses them of stumbling many people of Israel and corrupting the covenant God made with the tribe of Israel of Levi. Malachi 3 was not written to correct the lack of tithing of the people in Israel. The passage from Malachi 3 verses 8 to 12 was God's final verdict. Final verdict on the Levitical priests who did not repent of robbing God of his tithes and offerings. Now to further understand about this tithing, there are four levels of tithing under the Levitical priesthood, okay? We're talking now about the Levitical priesthood, not the Melchizedek priesthood, because Malachi, the book of Malachi, is about the Levitical priesthood tithing, okay? Now we'll see you. What are the four levels of tithing under the Levitical priesthood? Let's look at Nephi, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38. A priest, a descendant of Aaron, will be with the Levites as they receive these tithes. Okay? And a tenth of all that is collected will be delivered by the Levites to the temple of God and placed in the storeroom. A tenth of the tenth. A tithe of the tithe will be given to the descendants of Aaron to bring into the storehouse. Under the priestly order of Aaron, or the Levitical order, there were several layers of tithing. Yes. There was a tithe. The general population of Israel gave to the Levites. Yes, the general height of their income, of their increase, they gave it to the Levites. Then there was a tithe that the Levites gave to the high priestly order of Aaron, and that is the tithe of the tithes. The Levites received the tithe from the general population of Israel, and from the tithes they got a tithe and gave it to Aaron, the high priest, and to his uh, family. Yes, that's the second uh, kind of tithing. The people of Israel also kept a tithe to pay for their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22 to 26. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all the fields of your fields produced each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of your God, and the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is not too distant, okay, like coming to Jerusalem, it's too distant for those other tribes who are far away. Verse 24, but if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe, can carry your animals, because the place where the Lord will choose put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you. 
exchange your animals with money so that you can bring your money with you and go to the place, <coughs> excuse me, and go to the place the Lord will, God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, and other fermented drink or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. Okay? There was a tithe that they had to keep. So that when they go to Jerusalem, where the temple was located, they will, they will their hands will not be empty. Fourth, the people paid a tithe to take care of the poor, to take care of the orphans, and the widows. They, they pay the tithe to take care of the poor, the orphans, and the widows. Can you just imagine? Deuteronomy 14, verse 28, 29. At the end of every three years, that's every three years, they gave a tithe for the poor, the orphans, and the widows. At, every, at the end of every three years, bring all the tithe of that year's produce and store it into your, in your towns. Okay? The third year, all the tithes, they will give it for the orphans, the poor, and the widows. So that the Levites who have no allotment, okay, or inheritance of their own, not just for the Levites, and the foreigners, and the fatherless, and the widows to live in the towns may come, okay, and eat and be satisfied. Wow, there will always be supply of food. So that the Lord your God may bless you in the work, in all the work of your hands. Now, once we understand these four layers of tithing under the priestly order of Aaron, understanding the context of Malachi 3 becomes quite more easy. When God poised the question, will a man rob God? And you say, Wherein have we robbed you? God answered in tithes and offerings. That means in reference to the four, uh, four levels of tithing in the Levitical order of uh, tithing. Now, who was God really talk, talking about? God was not accusing the people of robbing him of his tithes and offerings. No. He was accusing the priests. He was accusing the pastors or spiritual leaders of Israel of robbing him of tithes and offerings. The book of Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38, completely solves the mystery of Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. The prophet Malachi under identifies a storehouse, or the prophet Nehemiah rather, identifies a storehouse that the prophet Malachi was alluding to in the third chapter of Malachi. The law of Moses instructed the Levites to give a tithe of the tithe to the household, to the household of Aaron. Members of the household of Aaron were the only ones among the Levites who were appointed by God to the office of the high priest. Nobody else, but only from the family line of Aaron. They were the ones who were going to be appointed to the office of the high priest. <coughs> they lived on the type of all the type. That's how they were sustained. That's how they were able to live. That the Levites collected from all the tribes of Israel, they gave a type of the types. To the family of Aaron. Now, during Malachi's, Malachi's time, some members of the Levitical priesthood were so corrupt. They were so corrupt that they were not giving the household of Aaron the rightful portions of the tithe of the tithes. No. They did not give the tithe of the tithes. They gave only a little. Are you under the law of Moses or under grace? You, today, the church, in the New Testament, are we under the law of Moses or under grace? You know, we can no longer preach the gospel, the kingdom, 
and live under the dispensation of grace if we continue to tithe according to the law of Moses. Hmm. You know, money, it is the lowest asset in the kingdom of God. There is undue emphasis of money. Yes. Money has been emphasized and duly as one of the primary benefits of tithing. You know, because of that, it's one of the major flaws in the teaching of tithing that is based on Malachi, the Malachi 3, 8 to 12 model. Money should not be emphasized because it is not one of the primary benefits. But according to the teaching, if you want to have money, you have to tithe. That is the reason many want to tithe because they want to have more money. The proponents of Malachi 3 verses 8 to 12 pattern of tithing. They inform the listeners that the primary benefit of tithing is a supernatural acquisition of more money for the personal economy. If you tithe, you will have more money. More money is going to come back to you. And you know, consequently, the primary penalty for not tithing is the manifestation of financial curse. Because you did not tithe, you have no money, you're poor. It's a manifestation of financial curse over the personal economy of those who refuse to pay the Lord's tithe. Wow. A kind of undue emphasis on money as one of the major and primary benefits of tithing has become the source of much frustration of many. They tithe faithfully, sincerely, God-loving people because they want to have more money. But it is the cause of frustration for many. The lack of tangible financial resources in the lives of some very faithful titers clearly indicate that acquiring more money is not the primary benefit of tithing as far as God is concerned. Wow. Now, this is not to discourage faithful titers, of course. However, if you gave, if God gave you the choice to choose between more money or getting more through heavenly riches that money cannot buy, what would you choose? Would you choose more money or would you choose through heavenly riches that money cannot buy? What would you choose? Which is more important to you, money or through heavenly riches? Now, to be honest, the undue emphasis of making money the primary benefit of tithing by those who use the Malachi 3 verse 8 to 12 tithing system has frustrated and disenfranchised many faithful tithers. Wow. Because the emphasis is getting, getting more money, not getting the true riches. Most of the faithful tithers feel like failures because monetarily, they are still not as rich as they would like to be. They're still struggling. Acquiring more money is not the primary benefit of tithing as far as God is concerned. Remember that. Now, there are also some wealthy Christians, very rich, and they attend church regularly but do not tithe regularly, even if they tithe at all. Yes, they come to church, but do they tithe? And they give, it's not even 10%, it's even 2%. Even if they tithe at all. There was one millionaire. And he was asked, Sir, do you type? Yes, I type. Do you give 10% of your income to the church? Uh, I don't give the whole 10%. I don't really type the entire uh, money because 
I do not trust what the pastor will do with that money. So I keep it and I just use it to, to fund activities, to give to the poor, to buy uh, uh, Bibles, but to give the entire type, which is by millions. No, no, no. I keep most of it and just do what I need to do. Now, that is the tithing. Because tithing is bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And not you don't even have the right to decide how to spend it and how to use a tithe. Nevertheless, these rich people, they seem to continue to prosper financially. They get richer and richer. Even if they don't tithe, even if they don't really, if, if, even if they don't tithe at all, they prosper financially more and more. So, he said about the Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 12, that when you tithe, you will be getting more money. Because those who don't even tithe are even getting more wealthy. Now, how do you explain this contradictory phenomenon to those who are faithful in tithing? Imagine, you tell Oprah Winfrey, millionaire, Bill Gates, billionaire, Donald Trump, billionaire, that they will be cursed with the final curse if they do not type. You know what? They will laugh at us. <laughs> Why? They have already made billions of dollars without typing, as they are for the most part, even they are unchurched, they don't type. <clears throat> Becoming financially wealthy through tithing is a byproduct of tithing correctly and assessing what Jesus called through accessing, getting hold of what Jesus called the true riches. Okay. Luke 16, verse 11. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, which is money, who will commit to you to, to your trust through riches? Okay. So this actually means if you don't type, how can you get hold of the true riches? <coughs> That's it. We want to get the true riches rather have, have than have all the money in the world because it will last throughout eternity. Money. You cannot bring it to your grave. You cannot bring it to the light in heaven. You leave your money behind. But the riches, you can bring them throughout eternity. So why are there so many wealthy people in the world? Yes, so many wealthy people in the world who have never given God his proper endowment of the tithe. Why? You know why? Jesus never regarded money as one of the highest assets in the kingdom of God. Okay? It's not the highest assets in the kingdom of God. On the contrary, Jesus called money unrighteous mammon. Wow. Money? Many want to have more money, but the Lord said it's unrighteous mammon. It doesn't mean that money by itself is evil. No. It's a love of money that is the root of all evil. Money is the lowest spiritual asset in God's kingdom economy, the lowest. So don't aspire to get the lowest to asset in the kingdom economy. You know why? Because money is manufactured in the realms of unrighteousness. Wow, does it come from heaven? It comes from the realms of unrighteousness. More importantly, God never created money. Oh, can you imagine that? You want to have more money, but God never created money. Mankind, in a way, of effecting in personal trade, there is a cost to have money because of the trade that man is doing. So man created money. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, the world we live has fallen into the zone of unrighteousness. Yes, when Adam and Eve was uh, removed, from Garden of Eden, the world that they entered was 
of unrighteousness, darkness, sinfulness. Now money is found in abundance in the realm of unrighteousness. You go. You go to the casino. You go to all those where vices are, are, are so uh, rampant. There's lots of money there. That is why thieves can simply break in into a house or rob a bank and come out with loads of cash. Money is the lowest asset in God's economy because it is the creation of fallen man. Jesus told us that money is not even included in the list of what Jesus called true riches. It's not in the list. If money is the lowest asset in God's economy, why is it? Those who teach tithing, according to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, 12, give it a place of uttermost importance. Why? Money is the number one price asset. Number one price asset in the Babylon, Babylonian system of human government. Men in the Babylonian system of government, many want to have money, many want to be wealthy, many want to be rich. That is the Babylonian system. Any tithing system that makes money or getting money the primary benefit of tithing is demonic in nature and can easily be attacked by demonic powers. Yes. Money is found in abundance in the realm of unrighteousness. So any tithing system that says that the acquisition of money is the primary benefit of tithing is inherently flawed and out of touch with God's divine order in the kingdom. You know what? God created that tithe to give the titers access to heaven's true riches. You want to have true riches? You have to be you have to be trusted with the little. You have to be trusted with the little so that you will be trusted with the true riches. Getting more money is a byproduct of tithing for the right reasons. Yes. Don't get, don't tithe because you want to have more money. You tithe because you want to get more true riches. Tithing invokes the believer a special grace to prosper financially. Yes, if you tithe, you'll have special grace. If you tithe rightly, you'll have the special grace to prosper financially. However, getting more money is not the primary benefit of tithing. And you know what? When Abram gave a tithe of the spoils of war, gave it to Melchizedek, what did Melchizedek do? He brought out wine and bread. What? He brought out wine and bread. You know, bread the symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the bread of life. Bread is a symbol of the word of God. Bread is a symbol of getting into the, in the, in the substance of the kingdom, substance of the word. Bread, you receive the bread, the true riches, and the wine, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You pay your tithes, you get the bread, and you get the wine. You get more of insight, revelation. You get more into the secrets of the kingdom. You get the wine. You get more the leading of the Holy Spirit, infilling the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Get the true riches. And getting more money, it will just be the byproduct. Because you get hold of the true riches. Let us pray. Today, O oh Father, would like to lay everything at your feet, even at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
that every um, every foolish thing we did regarding tithing, we would like to ask for forgiveness. From here onwards, we will tithe according to the order of Melchizedek because Jesus is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek and we tithe to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because we want more money, but we want to have more of him. We want to have more of the kingdom. We want to have more understanding, revelation. We want to have more of the meat of the word. We want to have more of you, God. So, anoint us, empower us, that even the little that we have, we are able to tithe. Even like the old widow who gave out of her nothingness, of her poverty, who gave of her two mites. And even if we become so wealthy that we, it will not be a stumbling block to us to give a tithe of the wealth that of our increase. So, Father, may your name be glorified. Change the way we tithe. Let us tithe the right way, God, that we will tithe to the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Thank you, Lord. And may your grace be more than enough for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, we want to honor our Father. And you know what? Honoring somebody should be exciting. Honoring our Father who is in heaven should be with passion. That's why we can give cheerfully. Because we know we're honoring the God who is the author of life, who created heaven and earth, who started everything. And so with this, we would like to get hold, to find access, to get access into the holy presence of God. God bless you. And have a very powerful week ahead. God is good.